And again. Oh. Okay. I'm just waiting on a notification, sir. Silence. And we are live. So, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this afternoon. We have a very great guest with us, one who I am blessed to know um, over the last 15 years and to see him and his family. What a beautiful family you all have. And just to see your spirit and energy, bro, Kenneth, it really means a lot that you would take time out. Oh, it's my honor, brother. Thank you. Your busy I schedule. You. I saw him well, yes, sir. Okay. All right. My sister Mimi says I'm making him as well, bro, Kenneth. Like long until I got to get her to sign my book, the children's book. Okay. Yes, sir. I will absolutely let her right. know that. Okay. Um, first of all, Brett Kenneth, the, the first question that we want to know is, um, for as long as I've been alive, you've been a member of the Nation of Islam that I can recognize. You know, you watched me grow up. But when did you first hear the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Wow. Let me try to give you the short version. It most uh, I could pinpoint it to about 1972. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, some of the projects. Um, 1043 Myrtle Avenue, the exact apartment 2C. Shout out yes, to uh, teach some of the PJs. And it's about 1972. And I don't know if you uh, know or heard of Brother Malachi. Um, he's, you know, I grew up with him. He was like a big brother to me. Yes, sir. And one day, so I was about 12 years old, 60 years old now. And Malachi asked us all, uh, Malachi may be a year too old than us. He asked us, the young brothers, he said, where's God? Well, who's God? And we was, I was like, God, God's up in the sky. He's up in the sky. He said, no, he ain't up in the sky. So we, you know, we waiting for other people giving uh, uh, answers. But that's when I first heard the teaching, Malachi said, the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker owner, the cream of the planet earth, God of the universe. He said, you're God, God is in you. And that turned on the switch for me because I think I was going to church and going to the Sunday schools and I'm reading the Bible and it just didn't you know click with me I'm reading how Cain slew Abel and then Cain went off to another land with some other people and I was like yeah but I thought they were the only people on the planet so where did these other people come from <clears throat> so I got into the teachings then uh actually it was Malachi brother Saladin the great Saladin who was a teacher over there in uh, some of the projects. And he more so taught me uh, Islam, about the nation of Islam, gave message to the black man. Uh, we read seven speeches of Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes, sir. Uh, and, but it's, it was actually brother who first brought me to the mosque, brother Rashad. These were twin brothers, Rashad and Kushmir, they was better known as uh, Mark and Mac, Mac and mm -hmm. Mark, um, they joined the nation. And then um, brother brought me around 1973, 1974 to the mosque. And that's when I just accepted Islam then. I mean, stop eating pork, espouse the teaching. I was too young to join, but I consider myself, you know, Muslim, follower of honorable Elijah Muhammad. Praise be to Allah. <clears throat> um, my sister Miriam says, of course, Sister Kaneda says, She's giving you the greetings. <clears throat> oh, please. Yes. I think she's in the other room back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. My next question, uh, for you, brother, brother Kenneth, is how did your parents feel once you did accept the teachings? That was a thing, because I was sort of quiet about that. Because I know some, I've heard some people, they came home throwing pork out the refrigerator and saying, I ain't going to do this. So, you know, white man's a devil. I mean, attacking, you know, Christianity and stuff like that, but I was quiet about it. And I came home and I don't say I came home, but I had stopped eating pork. My mother would serve would one time serve pork. And you know, you got brothers and sisters and whatnot. They they giggling to my mother like, why you ain't eating? I don't want to eat the pork no more. What? So I don't eat pork no more. <laughs> so she was like, well, I guess you ain't gonna eat today. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't, with my mom, it wasn't 
uh, you know, a, a knockdown, drag down thing. Because again, like I'm 13, I'm coming into myself. And um, at that time, you know, I wasn't doing drugs and stuff like that. When I got older, around 75, 76, that's when I got into doing drugs because the nation had fell. But when the, while the nation was here from 72 to 75, I was strong with it, you know? I didn't succumb to drinking and getting high because the brothers that I was around, L. Isaiah, the, uh, the twin brothers, they didn't tolerate that. You couldn't come around the Muslims if you were smoking and drinking and doing it. I mean, you come around them, but you had to put that stuff down if you was gonna hang out with them and get the knowledge. So she seen me go from, you know, just a youth, I just figured filling myself out into the later seventies where I got into uh, 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 getting arrested, going to uh, jail and things like that. But then turning myself around in 1980 when the minister came back. So uh, with my mom, it was easy. Pops wasn't there. Mom and pop had separated around the early seventies. So he wasn't there, but she sort of seen the um, transformation. Beautiful, praise be to Allah. And what was it prior to 75? Um, what was the culture like for you being so young? Wow, back then, you know, again, I'm a 60s baby, so I came up in the 70s. Um, you had, um, you know, different influences. Um, I know I, I, I lost an uncle to heroin. And mm. I was, again, I was about 14 years old, 15 years old. So, you know, you, you had those things, those vices out there. I mean, I used to go up to 116th Street because I had an aunt, the black family. Uh, shout out to the, uh, my uh, cousins up in uh, Harlem. They lived on 118th and Lennox. And the Mars was on two blocks down, 116th and Lennox. But in the 70s and late 60s, 70s, we would go to visit them and there were junkies all over. Mm. I mean, you mm. you you go into the building, you got a junkie in the stairway with a needle in their arm, shooting up. You got some that's uh, uh, just nodded out. But with my aunt, she would call and say, I got my niece and nephews coming. Them junkies, they they respected my aunt and them. They, they oh, yes, yes, ma'am, yes, yes, ma'am, Miss, Miss Black, yes, ma'am. And wouldn't bother you, but seeing those things, that was one thing me and my friends growing up, we wouldn't do, man. We wouldn't shoot drugs, but we did get into, as now you have the uh, weed culture, you know, smoking weed, doing all that. I mean, I got to admit, I sold weed. My daughter the other day, my youngest daughter said, Dad, you ain't sell no weed. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, you better ask somebody about that. <laughs> we did a lot, but again, that was, that was uh, after 75, but Again, during that time as a teenager, you know, I had my older sister, Gloria, God bless her, and my other sister, Cheryl, uh, and she rest in peace. Um, they were big influences on me to keep me away from, you know, going into the streets and, and, and you know, getting too deeply involved. Praise be to Allah. Okay, excellent. Brother Joseph says his brother Kenneth and, um, um, really, oh, Brother Damien says, I'll smack him as well. Like him salam, sir. Like him salam. Um, uh, and then Kaneda said, he definitely said that. Okay, wonderful. My next question uh, for you, Brother Kenneth, is um, what made you come back and accept the teachings once the most high was far kind of stood back up? Well, that was the thing. I would call myself back then in the 70s, like uh, one of the street followers. You know, I wasn't registered. I didn't follow how to eat to live. You know, like I said, I, I only been to the mosque once. But I listened to the teaching. The brothers, the, 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 the Muslims were strong in Brooklyn. So if you go downtown Brooklyn, you seen the brother selling the Muhammad speech. The brothers were coming door to door, excuse me, in, in the projects. They were selling the fish or they were selling eggs and other products. So the Muslims, the, the Muslims were strong. Again, I, I, I was in the nation. And that sort of helped me from getting into when. I'm seeing some of my older friends, they smoke and drink, getting high. And I'm like, y'all yeah, niggas gonna die, man. Y'all keep smoking, drinking and getting high. And I had that uh, uh, um, strength not to go with that. Nation falls in 75, I'm only 15 years old. 
but I'm listening to what, you know, what's going on. Cause I remember I was sitting in 1043 and they said, they had said the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had passed and it was a brother, Elijah. Uh, he was better known as Jerry. He was saying, man, he can't be dead. He can't be dead. He ain't finished his mission yet. So I'm sitting there to, you know, listening to him, like, you know, minister say he was listening to brother Jabril, you know, poor brother, you know, he can't, just can't take it. But that, you know, coming further down, you know, the minister would manifest that in 1981. Yes, sir. But, but um, they, you know, they started talking about who would lead the nation then. And, you know, they was talking about the minister and this minister from here, this minister, they might have mentioned brother Rahman, but I said, well, what about Muhammad Ali? It's man, get out of here with that, man. Muhammad Ali ain't a yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> Cause they were in the nation, they were registered. So they, you know, no disrespect to Muhammad Ali, please. He brought more people to the nation than anyone. But they were just trying to talk about who would be the leader and come that the Imam Barthin became the leader. Yes, sir. And they had their little uh, uh, differences with, with that. But 1976 rolls around and Imam comes to uh, the Felt Forum. And he was just dismantling the teachings and just like the Muslims went out to the world, I just went out to the world. You know, we sitting around and Muslims partying in the street with, you know, cause at that time we, they had played the music in the uh, parks or a basketball court and the Muslims just lost the discipline, you know, no more MGT garment, no more FOI uniform. So I seen that dismantling and I'm falling into the grade two. 75 say smoking weed, getting high, drinking, get arrested in 77, I think. Just a little, little 30 days in jail. So no, no big time, anything like that. Yes, sir. But I mean, I was, uh, just to tell the truth, I was smoking weed. I would wake up smoking a joint and go to sleep smoking a joint. Mm. And, you know, just drinking and getting high. And I knew better because, you know, when you have the teachings and you go into the grave, you know, and no, uh, this is, you know, this ain't right, exactly, man. I got to clean yes, myself sir. up. So 78 rolls around, around 79, I said, man, I got to get out of this here. So I stopped smoking and getting high. And I remember I had my friend and uh, my homeboy, you know, he was like, yo, man, take this, hit this weed here, hit this weed, because I already told him I wasn't smoking. And um, he got mad at me because I wouldn't just take a puff of the weed. He said, oh, mm -hmm. man, the hell with you, man, I don't need you. I don't need you to, to, to you know, take this weed, you know, I'm paraphrasing. Yes, but it sir. got quiet for a second and then he said, yeah, man, I need to quit smoking too, man. <laughs> 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 but that day I knew I was free, but they say it take 21 days to break a habit, to make a break a habit. So I knew it had been 21 days. I said, look, I ain't gonna smoke no weed by the grace of Allah. I haven't smoked weed since then. But this is 79, I'm gonna be a little long, long winded. And you know, the 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 um, nation of Islam under the imam, you know that wasn't uh, what's the word I could say for that wasn't interesting to me for lack of a better word. Mm. And then come seventy nine, a brother had the final call. One of the same brothers, one of the twin brothers. He said Farrakhan trying to rebuild the nation. Farrakhan talking about building the nation. He had one of the final call. I said, man, let me let me let me get that man. He said, no, man, you got to get your own. So he let <laughs> me read it. And then I got the address where you could uh, apply uh, um, to uh, subscribe to the final call. So I should subscribe to the final call. I remember the name I used because they knew me as Ken Do in some, of the, in some of the projects. So I put my name down, Ken Do Akbu. And Akbu, I got that from uh, Dr. Ben because that's what he sort of called Africa, Akbu Lab. So I just took part of that name. But Yes, sir. That was then. So then the minister came back May 18th, 1980. Everybody got to get that lecture. Liberty or death. When the minister came back at uh, City College, and that was May 18th, 1980, and 10,000 people came out. Dang. So that was a day that um, first time I actually seen Minister Farrakhan live, because all the other times I either seen him listen to him on the radio or seeing him, what was that show he was on? Soul or something like that? So, sorry for the tangent, but- um, Oh, that's it, that's it. Sorry, we even forgot the question now. 
Okay, yes, sir. No, no, no. You answered you uh, absolutely answered the question of why you came back. Uh, Liberty or Death, 1980. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, my sister Naima sends a brother Dominique um says uh, somebody can oh, yes, sir, How could I see them on here? Is there a way I could see them or no? Uh I mean after it'll be it'll probably come up. Um no. my next question for you, sir, is um New York. Um, when mm -hmm. people think of New York, many times from their living color on the YouTube clips, it is shown of them, um, you know, making fun of or, my, or you know, impersonating Damon Wayne's impersonating the minister of uh, doing his Madison Square Garden speech. Um, you were there, uh, were you there? I mean, you were there, and how did that yeah, impact sure. you? And can you give us the details on the uh, the power at last speech? Oh man, that was 1985. I had been a nation for or five years at that time. And um, that was a powerful day that day because, uh, you know, I was telling you earlier and I was listening to, uh, you said, Brother Bashir. Yes, sir. And uh, brother, I was listening to Brother Kadir on another um, interview. And Brother Kadir, I remember seeing him May 18th, 1980 at the, the minister lecture. And um, that day I was telling you like Brother Sterling in Jersey was the captain. And he had yes, me to roam, to do a Roman security around Madison Square Garden. Um, but prior to that, I mean, people, they, like brother said, I could bear when they were tearing the door down to get into Madison Square Garden. People were throwing away cameras, whatever we told them they can't have, knives and all this other stuff. And literally broke the, the glass to the doors, to the windows. Uh, um, but I remember just, uh, um, Roman that day and it, there's a fire that started like brother was saying. And I remember I ran back into the area, the locker room where it was, but it was so much smoke that I got pushed back and had to run back out the room. I even had a, a burn, I had a beige suit, I had a burn on my um, suit. And I ran to where there was a fire hose and ran and pulled it off and gave it to brother and turned on the water. And brother ran back there. I think they said, because it was in the final call, I think it was a brother Sterling from Washington, DC, who had helped to put out the fire. Yes, sir. And uh, other brothers, they had gotten uh, fire extinguishers and stuff like that, and ran and put out the fire. And brother Linwood, Leonard Farrakhan was there that day and the fire chief were there and the police and they were like, we got to evacuate, we got to evacuate, like uh, bro brother was saying. And brother Leonard said, no, you ain't evacuating this place. You started that one stampede in this place. So, excuse me, he cut, they cut, he cut that out that day. So whether that was intentional or unintentional, that could have been a, a disastrous day. But that day, I mean, to compare that, because it was Madison Square Garden held 25,000, I believe, and Felt Forum held about four or 5,000. So that was like the mini Million Man March. Mm, mm. Okay, great. And you weren't when you when you saw the fire that didn't make you afraid of anything, Brett Cannon? Well, I didn't really like I said, I didn't see a fire. I seen the smoke coming out of the room. Yes, sir. And I tried to run in there. I can't remember if I had the fire extinguisher or the brother had fire extinguisher. And I was trying to run in behind the brother, but the smoke was so overpowering, it just billowed out and just knocked me back. Um there's a photo, I have it downstairs, but it's um there's a photo of Madison Square Garden. And in that photo, you could see almost, I mean, Brother Abdullah, Brother Joshua Farrakhan, this person, that person. And I, I seen myself, I mean, you had to really look, but I was standing there that day, I was standing there like this. And the brother that I was standing next to, he said, hey, brother, you said, you smell like smoke, man. I said, mm. man, if you only knew, yeah, if you only knew, that. man, she would, what, what, what had just happened. So no, it, it, you know, it wasn't a fear thing. It was trying to get, you know, the fire, you know, trying to get that fire out that day. Praise be to Allah. Okay, excellent. My next question for you, Brett Kenneth, is um, you um, have been very uh, inspirational to me personally, but very vocal about having a successful uh, kidney transplant. Can you let us know uh, what transpired and how, um, how, 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 did that, how did that go? Well, I gotta, I gotta thank Allah to put bring me through that, but I thank a lot for brother Jason. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he he's on here now, but 
that brother practically saved my life when he donated his kidney to me. Um, he stood up. I mean, I have four brothers and he, he stood up even before them. Two of them couldn't give it. And the other two, I know, I know they were afraid because I probably, I don't know if I would have did, you know, what brother did because especially with black people, when you're talking about operating and cutting on us, we get, no, we back off. I mean, you got some family now, they're like angry with each other because one won't donate, you know, the kidney and stuff like that. But um, I know they were, they were afraid, but Jason just came up and stepped up and um, donated his kidney back in, um, it was March 28th, 9th, uh, uh, 2005. But the, I had started having, um, I really the, the cause of my kidney loss was uh, lupus. And in 1990, I started to get um, arthritic pain. And I mean, it became debilitating, swelling in my hands, uh, my knees, and just pain. I couldn't walk some time. And I worked for New York City Transit. And sometimes I would have the easiest jobs. And I just couldn't do the job because my, my hands had swell and it was just painful just to even touch my tools. So that went on for about 10 years. Cause I had got, I remember I went to a doctor. My doctor diagnosed it as rheumatoid arthritis, but I had went to get a second opinion. And this doctor, and this is back in 1990, wasn't much known then as it is now about lupus. And lupus is mainly, uh, uh, I wanna say female, they're mainly the ones who get lupus. But the doctor took a test, he said, you know what? It looks like lupus, but I can't confirm it. And he said that that's how lupus is. Lupus will mimic other diseases. Mm. So they didn't have, uh, I don't know if even till today if they, they have it. I got my oldest sister, she's suffering from it, uh, but not as debilitating because you have some, I know some people that, brother, he lost his wife from it because once it starts attacking your organs, it's your. Your, your, your immune system attacking your body. So it'll start to attack your kidneys, your lungs, your heart. It, it, it'll devastate uh, your body. So that went on, the, the arthritic pain went on from 1990 to 2000. And around 2000, I would get tested on my job often because you know we operated the trains. They started seeing um, a lot of protein in my urine and uh, that's a sign of um, your kidneys failing. And my kidney function started to diminish. So they were giving me medication for that. But by 2003, my kidneys started to fail. My legs started to swell and started to feel lethargic. And then the uh, doctor told me, yeah, you're gonna have to go on dialysis. And I never knew, I've heard of dialysis, but never knew what dialysis was. So, um, that day around the around same time in March, I uh, went into renal failure and um, had to go on dialysis. So I was on dialysis for two years from 2003 to 2005 until uh, my great brother, Jason, Jason uh, Exalori, as he is on Facebook, uh, donated his kidney to me. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And um, did that, was that awkward for you? With your siblings, once he did that, did, did that cause any rift with you and your siblings? No, no. Because, no. see, I never asked anybody when I was on the, the dialysis. I don't know if they're watching or they're going to see this. I never asked anyone because I just did the dialysis. And the, the dialysis would be bad also because I got infections a couple of times. Um, some people, it's, it's different. One guy, he worked for transit. He would get dialysis and go to work. Me, I, I thought I, after I got Dallas, it felt like a vampire had sucked all my blood. So I just, I would still feel tired. And I mean, they, they would always, you wanna go back to work? You wanna go back? I said, no, I don't wanna go back to work. You know, they, all they gonna do is fire me over there or put me in a, a lower position where, uh, where they'll put me in, uh, what they call, uh, back into some other position and make me, put me back on probation and then they'll be able to fire me. So I'm like, no, I and, but I got to say, with, with the uh, uh, transit, with their benefits and everything, they took care of everything with me and brother. The medications, even till today, they pay for very expensive medication for uh, uh, even when I have the uh, 
the transplant with the uh, operation with the um uh, um kidney transplant you got to take all these um you got excuse me a little nervous got to take all the um anti-rejection medications and they're very expensive but yeah no no i didn't hate them because like i said two of them couldn't do it they were willing and again the other two i know they like i said you you man ask somebody ask somebody now <laughs> yo give me a kidney see <laughs> But you know what I'm going to do because I thank Allah for your mother. Because when I was going through it, and I'm hoping not I aligned in it with this, but she had then an article in the final call about renal failure, kidney, you know, being on kidney on dialysis. And, exactly. I, and I was reading that, I was like, wow, I'm not the only one, you know, going through this, especially in the nation. And then my brother Malachi, the brother I was telling you about, uh, he had, he was on dialysis, dialysis for about a year prior to that. And um, I'll be pleased with him. He uh, passed away several years ago uh, for, for some other complications. But like I said, I just, I just thank your mom, you know, cause we, people that uh, get on dialysis and especially transplant people, you, I mean, I love, oh, please. The best people in the world, the transplant people, they lay down their life. Uh, with, with the brother Ab Abdullah daughter, you know brother Abdullah, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. His daughter, uh, uh, donor, yes, uh, sir. sister in the Mars, uh, I forget her name. She just donated to her father a couple of years yes, ago. Yes, sir. I saw that. Sir. Uh, uh, other brothers and sisters, you know, and you know that is a, a courageous, courageous thing to do. Like I said, I don't myself. I don't know if I would do it, you know, but I think again, it's the fear. So that's the first thing people ask me, how brother Jason do? Said, Jason, all right, that man, <laughs> he's still gone. Oh, he gone. Yeah, you can live with, with one kidney and, um, you know, do a, 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 and live a, a regular life. Matter of fact, his wife, his mom, he said, his wife told him, he said, if it wasn't brother Kenneth, I would have told him no. So I'm like, Shh, I must have did something. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. I think I know what it is. One day, brother Jason, I'm going to go on a little tangent. Yes, sir. Brother Jason, I told him he owed me. So I, he said, brother, I want to do, he was doing a show at the Apollo. So brother Jason does rap. Mm. So he said, man, I just need you, you know, to come. I said, I, you know, I don't rap, man. What you want me to do? He said, come on, man. We're going to just, you know, the, uh, amateur night. He said, here, I want you to put this on and, you know, just come out on stage with me. I said, what's this? It was a Ku Klux Klan outfit. Mm. So he had a Ku Klux Klan hoodie and a Ku Klux Klan outfit, and he put the rope, a rope on my neck and pulled me out onto the stage on the Apollo Theater. <laughs> said, mm, mm, mm. I said, bro, are you crazy? You, the people going to kill me. You bring me out in a Ku Klux yes, Klan yes, <laughs> outfit. But he pulled me out there on the rope, and he said, yo, y'all just uh, 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 came from down south, and I brought y'all a souvenir. And mm, he just told mm. me, sit down. And then he did his rap, uh, mm, Black mm, Like mm, Me. Mm, 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 and this is back, uh, Jay, he could probably tell, maybe back in the 90s or something like that. I said, yo, bro, you owe me for that one. So <laughs> <laughs> that might have enticed him. Praise be to That's a beautiful story. And your daughter, Sister Connecticut said, Brother Jason is her godfather, and we are yes. back and, um, in debt to him. And, um, and she also said she never heard Forever. that story before. And, and oh man, yeah, yes sir. And I'm that's real brotherhood uh, to, to you and brother Jason. Yes. Thank you to a lot. Um, my next question for you is: you um, on a picture I used for a flyer. I went on your Facebook and I saw. Well, I know you were doing both sides since I've been in Atlanta, but I didn't know you were doing them in New York. Yes sir. Uh, how did you get into doing both sides? And um, what is what makes you so passionate about uh, making both sides? That's that's another story. Okay, we've been going for about a half an hour, excuse me. But I, I, I started doing bow ties when I, again, back in 1980, when the minister had brought the nation back. And, uh, you know, the brothers, we needed bow ties. But to, way before that, back in 1973, that's when I started to learn how to sew. And back then, us cats in Brooklyn, we used to wear tailor-made pants. And, uh, I was again 13 years old, and to get a pair of tailor made pants, you had to buy yard and a half fabric. That was about four or five dollars. And then you had to take it to the tailor 
and he would make the uh, pants for you for about $12, $12, $15. And that was expensive back then. You know, we had the bell bottom pants, you know, like you showed that picture of uh, the Isley brothers and whatnot. You were saying, you're talking about how we dress. That's how we dress with the bell bottoms and a long collar. So one pair of pants, about $15, $20, say $18, right? And I told my mom, 13 year old mom, I went and get some telemade pants. She said, well, how much they cost? I said, uh, $18. She said, for how many pair? I said, one pair. She said, one pair? She said, boy, I'll get you three pair of pants for that, for that amount. Hmm. And I said, I don't want them daggone plaid pants to, you know, that they made. <laughs> I want the telemade, you know, that the older brother boys is 15, 16 years old wear. Yes, so my, my oldest sister, and God bless my brothers and sisters, about four brothers, three sisters. Um, she said, look, I'll make, I hope you will. She said, I'll make, I, you can make, you can make them pants. And uh, no disrespect. I said, I ain't going to make no pants. I ain't no, I don't sew. I ain't no faggot. She mm -hmm. said, well, who's making your pants? I said, the guy over there said, is he a faggot? I said, no, he ain't a faggot. So, you know, then you could, you could make them. So, Try to make long story short. We bought the material, try to make the pants. They came out. I couldn't I had to use them as pajamas because they didn't come out right. But that's <laughs> when I started to learn how to sew. And that's when uh Malachi, brother, because Malachi had a store on 125th Street called Bell's Fashion. And that was down the block from Dapper Dan. So it was sort of his uh, I don't want to say competition, but protege. And we learned a lot from uh Dap at that time because. From that, from me, from 73, making telemade pants, moon fashions, everybody grew up in New in Brooklyn, new moons fashion. There was a, a Hispanic brother. He made telemade pants on Broadway. Uh, I started making telemade pants, got into making bags. Um, we started making women's floor sweaters and hats. And okay, I used to okay. make my mother, I used to make my mother church clothes. Mm, and she mm. would go to okay, church okay. and they'd go, they'd be like, Oh, Miss Kelly, you you looking good. She said, where you get that outfit from? My son made this outfit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got into making clothes and making other things and, and making money. So by the time 1980 rolled around, I started to get into making bow ties. And uh, the way I started, I took the bow tie apart, put it back together, get a bow tie from the store, take it and put it back together. And now I've been doing it off and on for, um, 40 years so that's part of you know part of the way and what else i doing you see this flag i got behind me i, I make flags oh, oh, yeah, man. Yeah. I, I got into so uh, you know so many other things you know just just making clothes but right now my forte is uh doing the bow ties Praise Praise thank you for that and thank you for being a sponsor of the people's podcast usually, oh yes sir. This is, usually this is when we go into our sponsorship but i let yes. all the sponsors know that within the next three days, um, we we got so many sponsors, I couldn't read them off the list. So we'll be doing a virtual sponsorship very soon this week, inshallah, and you will see all your sponsors running in a commercial form because I don't want to just keep reading so many of the uh, sponsors. So I thank you all for your patience. Thank you all for continuing to support the People's Podcast, Cash App People's Podcast, for your donations. And thank you, Brother Kenneth, for being one of the sponsors. My next thank question you. for you, Brother Kenneth, is recently you said, um, that you told me that you beat uh, COVID. Uh, how, yes, how, how, how was that? Um, well, first of all, when you say you beat it, there are a lot of conspiracy theories. A lot of people who right, are on social media right. who say it's not real. Is it real? Oh, yes, it's real. But let me do my commercial before you know you go. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Don't nobody make bow ties quite like me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> they stop. Bow tie right here. Bow tie make extraordinaire. I used, always, I used to tell that to Rock, it used to tickle him. Uh, um, yes, sir. But yeah, it's, it's real, you know? I mean, again, you say people have conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Okay, you could go along with that. Go take yourself into a hospital and see how much of a conspiracy it is and listen to some of the stories. But what had happened, <laughs> I, I had went to New York back in March and um, I went up there, so I had had it pre-planned because I had my birthday in January, turned 60, and I told my mom and them because they couldn't make it down, I'm gonna come up there and we may celebrate it and, 
my mother-in-law, she was having a birthday thing. So I said, let me go up there. And as I'm going up there, that's when everything was breaking out. They weren't met wearing masks or anything like that at that time. But as on my way up, I was spraying stuff and wiping stuff down. So I get up there. I was probably going to stay for two weeks, but I just stayed one week. So it was around the 13th, 14th when I got there. I came back around the 18th and 19th. And um, it's ironic because I was going to, usually I go up there, I go to Manhattan Mars and I go to Brooklyn Mars or I'll go to FOI class and try to catch, you know, everybody. And, you know, I usually make it a point to go see student minister. I fees. Yes, so I was in Brooklyn and I seen student minister, um, now I need some tissue. I seen student minister um, Henry. And brother that passed that was in the, the montage. What was his name? Uh, not Tariq. I forget brother name now. Allah forgive me. But he was in that montage with uh, Hafiz. Yes, Maybe sir. somebody would know. But um, I seen him at the mosque that that Sunday. And you know, we at that time we were just elbowing. We wasn't greeting and everything else. And I also seen him in FOI class. And when I was in FOI class, the brothers were like, bro, Kendall, come on over here. You know, study with us. I said, nah, you know, I'm one of them. Uh, I'm in that group where, you know, I'm vulnerable. I said, I can't be around everybody. So on my way back home down here to Georgia, I started feeling a little cough. And, you know, it wasn't just a little slight thing. It wasn't anything bothersome. I got here around 18 or 19 because I stopped over in Virginia. Cause I stopped driving straight through New York. Cause I get there and I got to rest for a whole day. So I stopped in Virginia going and coming back. When I got here, I got a sore throat on a Friday. I woke up Friday morning, had a sore throat. I started treating it, drinking, uh, uh, taking throat medicines. That went away. The sore throat went away. Come Sunday, I thought I had a fever. I test, uh, uh, got up and... I had a fever of like 100, but that was sort of a false fever because I had just got up and took my fever and that's what the doctors and nurses were saying. You just laying down, you're gonna be hot. Your body gonna be hot. I waited about another hour, took the test and then my temperature came down to normal. Come Monday, I started to lose my sense of taste and smell. And at that time, that was not, that was not one of the symptoms. The main symptoms were Fever, cough, and shortness of breath. And by the grace of Allah, I didn't have the fever. Never had a fever by the grace of Allah. I never had a shortness of breath. But I was walking out in front of my, uh, on my block, trying to just keep my breath up, walking around the house. You know how people tell you, hold your breath and do all of that. Um, I, I, I was doing that and never lost, you know, my shortness of breath. But that sense of taste and smell, by Wednesday was gone. My doctor told me, you know, because I'm a kidney transplant patient, he said, go to the hospital and get the test. And I was reluctant to go to the hospital because I'm like, no, they're dying in the hospital. I do not want to go there. But the doctor was like, you know, go there. You know, I have you set up and everything. I went there. Uh, they were waiting for me. They said, oh, we're waiting on you. And um, I asked them where they're going to give me a test. For the COVID, they said, for COVID, they said, we only test people who we admit. So I was like, well, are you admitting me? Because my doctor had, you know, mm, uh, mm. told me to come. He said, well, we're going to test you first. So I told him my symptoms. They gave me a test for strep throat and the flu. And then they took me to take x-rays. By the grace of Allah, the strep throat test came back negative and the flu test came back negative. And the x-rays came back clear. So I didn't have a cough at that time, but I'm talking to the doctors. So I'm like, well, are y'all going to give me the test? They're like, no. You know, Trump telling that lie. If you want a test, you can get a test. You know, this is this is uh, around March the 25th. And I, I, after seeing the doctor, you know, they told me no. So after talking to the doctor before he released me, he said, you know what? You most likely have it, but we we can't test you. So go home, quarantine yourself, et cetera, et cetera. So I get back here, I tell my daughters, and I'm look, we gotta stay apart and everything else. So try to make a long story short. 
So for about a week, I wouldn't eat. I mean, my daughters would bring me food with bean soup and salmon and everything else. And I would take three or four spoonfuls and wouldn't eat all the food. I was sitting back downstairs because I was like, I didn't have an appetite because I couldn't taste the food, I couldn't smell it. So I started to lose weight and I didn't have weight to lose. You know, I got a stomach I need to lose, but I didn't have about eight or 10 pounds to lose. And my blood pressure started to go down. So a week later, the doctor tell me, look, I said, my blood, pre blood pressure is low. He said, go to the hospital. Again, I don't want to go to this hospital. So I get to the hospital, take my blood pressure. You know, with me, usually, I, if I'm sick now, get to the hospital, I don't have the sickness or not, not, not the symptoms that I had. Blood pressure came back to normal. They still wouldn't test me for the, for the COVID-19 virus. Mm. They still would not test me. And I'm trying to put this stuff in perspective. The first time I went, they just gave me a cough medicine. And the second time I went, they started giving me stuff for allergies because they were saying, oh, this might just be an allergy. I never had an allergy. So they gave me the Allegra and this stuff and that stuff. Again, sent me back home. But the next, the, the, my doctor told me, go to this place the next day, take the test. So I went up into Cobb County somewhere, took the test. And that was the other thing. It took four or five days for the test to come back. Test come back positive. But I practically already knew that, you know, because th now they were saying lost sense of taste and smell is one of the symptoms. So Kaneda and my other daughter, they got up out of here. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> they went, got tests, came back by the grace of a lot of tests, came back negative, Perfect. and they got up out of here. They cooked me some food and stuff and, and, and got out of here, you know, by the grace of a lot. And so I told my daughters and them, because my youngest, Malika, God bless her, she's going for a doctor in the Morehouse. You know, she, um, you know, doing her little stuff on me. Uh, um, uh, losing my thought here a minute. But I told she, you know, she's a dad. Okay, next week, get the test. I said, no, I'm gonna give it two weeks. So about a two and a half weeks later, I took the test, but still they, the test wasn't coming back. It took them a week. I mean, they said, okay, we'll have it in three days. It wouldn't come. I had to scream on them. I said, let me talk to the supervisor. Cause I'm over here, it's been uh, six, seven days. And, you know, I'm not getting any results. Hang up the phone, call, lady called back. Uh, uh, what, oh, here's your test. Test had already been there. Mm, and they mm. just didn't, they wouldn't, uh, they, they just didn't, I don't know, follow through or whatever. By the grace of the Lord, it came back, you know, negative. So when you say beating it, I dealt with it by the grace of the Lord. Now I'm a kidney transplant patient taking immunosuppressant medication, prednisone, and, uh, uh, um, mycophenolate, tacrolimus, all, all that stuff. So to me, it's by the grace of Allah, how to eat to live, that um, I made it by the grace of Allah I do that, got my weight back. And that lasted for, again, about a month because it started in March and I didn't get my taste and smell back until about the end of April. And, but I had developed, that's the other thing, I had developed a cough. I had this cough that I would only cough when I would talk. Like now I should shut up, so I should start coughing. <laughs> but, yeah. but I would try to talk to someone on the phone and I couldn't finish the conversation. If I had to ask my daughter, can you, you know, do this and do this and do that? I would just, my diaphragm wouldn't allow me to talk. I would just start to cough. But it didn't bother me at night, I could sleep through the whole night when cough. Through the day, I might cough here and there. And that was just, you know, something that was uh, odd for me. And I just have to say, I've heard people been through worse. I don't think I've been through uh, uh, much. It was very harrowing, but I know other people, they've been through aches and pain, shortness of breath and fevers and stuff like that. But by the grace of Allah, I didn't go through as much. Praise be to Allah. Well, I'm glad that um, you are here and you are strong, Brother Kenneth. Uh, Brother Sultan um, of the E-Team says, this is divine, uh, the divine brotherhood, sisterhood of the love brought up from us, the people of God, through the Honorable Allah. Elijah Muhammad, and the student of the um, Muslim and the example of the Honorable Minister Farrakhan. 
brother, uh, first officer, well, I'm assuming this is brother, brother Salim says, but that was brother Latif, who was from Brooklyn, I'm assuming. Uh, Sister Kaneda said, um, she yeah, was brother out. Latif was the brother that passed, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sister Kaneda said she was out, but she left you food. Thank you, Sister <laughs> Kaneda, and your sisters for covering down on brother uh, okay. Kenneth. Brother Kenneth, speaking of covering down, uh, many people uh, may not know, but for years, you looked out for um, uh, Minister Abdul Rahman. Everywhere, every, everywhere he was, you were. Um, I mean, every time I saw him, you were there. Uh, what, what, how did you all form a bond? And was that an assignment you put yourself on? Or is that like, like how did that come about? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny too. Well, I never held a position in the mind. I think the only position I might have held was orientation uh, um, coordinator. Yes, and people saying, like, "Well, bro, why you ain't never?" Well, I was, I was always a what do you call it, a, a private soldier, a foot soldier. Yes, sir. I remember one guy was saying, "We got too many chiefs, no Indians." So I said, "I, I just be an Indian, right?" Yes, sir. Yeah. But um, first time I met Rock was actually in 1982, 83, when he had came back to the Mars. And it was on Eastern Parkway. And I got to give big ups to brother, at the time, then what the, the general known now as brother Kareem, because I yes, came sir. in under him. Came in under Alpha Farrakhan as a captain. Oh, man, I had so many different captains. You know, of course, being under your father. Uh, um, Dennis, Hawk, um, Anthony, Grandmaster, uh, Aziz, man, New York, I've you know, been through them, stu student ministers, uh, wonderful brothers and sisters, 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 captains and lieutenants. Um, but Rocket came to New York that day because he was doing, you know, the tour. I call it comeback tour. And I was sort of a jack. So I was, I was cutting hair, doing this, doing that, you know. And um, I would cut brother Kareem at the time, Linwood hair and brother, Rock mine had came, so I cut his hair, I gave him a haircut. And we was on Eastern Parkway that time. And brother uh, um, then would say, hey, you want something to eat? And Rock mine said, yeah, I want some oxtails. Where will you get some oxtail? And everybody looked at each other because they were like, I don't know where to get no oxtail. I said, I know where to get some oxtails from. It was a Jamaican spot down the hill that I would go get food from. Yes, I said, I'll be right back. I brought Rock some of them oxtails. Rock tore them oxtails up. That day, he tore the house down, you know, because we called him the country preacher. Yes, sir. And Rock just, you know, came there teaching uh, 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 probably like he did back back in the day. Now, he didn't even remember that when I told him. I said, Rock, you don't remember when I cut your hair that time? Blah, blah, blah. You know, he ain't going to remember half of that, you know. But when I came down here to Atlanta, I don't know, bro. I just sort of fell into that space because brother, who was it, brother? Uh, uh, is it Joshua? Brother Johnny was uh, really rock. Um, was the one that was holding rock down, driving him around, and everything. Brother John, it was brother John, mm. and his son is brother Jonathan, mm. and he was sort of a rocker. That's sort of just before we had the blue seas, but. I was, I didn't have a job or anything because I was on, on retirement disability, but I would be with Rock at the mall sometimes or be with him up at Blue Seas. And, you know, Rock said he liked New York people and he liked people that hustle. So I hustle. I sold prayer rugs, I lapel pins. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, you know, I, I just, you know, did anything entrepreneurial, you know, the bow ties and stuff like that. Holy Korans. I, you know, if there was something that I knew to get wholesale and sell it, that's what I would do. Excuse me. Let me get this. That's what uh, um, I would do. Because back in the day in New York, man, a brother could take $50, buy a product. Brother, buy socks. Sell them socks, make $100. Go back, re-up, as we say, sell them, make $200. $152. You know, and, and that's how some brothers, you know, uh, uh, survived. They were just showing a picture of Brother Allen on, uh, on a Facebook thing. That's the way he made money. But nonetheless, get back to rock. Yes, so sir. we, I just started to, because uh, uh, after the Rock uh, didn't drive as much, I just started to, you know, be with him. Well, come here, Kenny, come here. You know, <laughs> I, got, I got his voice on, on my cell phone. He would call me. And all he would say is, Rock mine, and then hang the phone up. <laughs> I go, 
I said, Rock, I said, you know, why you just hang the phone up? I don't like talking on the phone. You know, Rock is old school. You know, back then, we ain't take pictures. We ain't talk on the phone. I don't talk on the phone much. I said, well, what if you need me? You better say something. Say, help, or something. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. You just say your name. But we just just click like that. I mean, sometimes Rock would be sitting up at the front desk. Rock in it, Rock in it. Rock mom wants you. And I'll come running up there. Yes, sir, Rock. Yes, sir, what is it? I'll go over here and get this thing over here, brother. I'm like, Rock, you could have told one of them bros to do that. <laughs> why are you telling me? <laughs> he said, I said, Rock, why are you, why are you, uh, you so, you know, so attached to me? He said, because you understand me, brother. You understand me. So by the grace of Allah, we found, I mean, Rock, old as my father, you know, and, and Rock just didn't like to be, I don't say he didn't like to be around old folk, but, you know, he wasn't going to no home. I said, I like to be here where the action is, y'all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know? So, by the grace of Allah, it was an honor and a pleasure to uh, be with Rock, serve with Rock. Beautiful. Praise Rock, the Son. Thank Rock, you for that. Because you, I mean, man, you covered down for him and it, and it was always in good spirits. So, I appreciate that. And I'm sure that his family and the believers appreciate that as well. Yes, yeah, sir. And I'm going to say this too. I was, wasn't the only one. There's many other brothers and sisters that covered down on rock. I thank them much, uh, uh, Brother Johnny, Albert, uh, Kawi. Uh, I mean, brothers would just come by and just, you know, shake his hand. You know, sisters would come by and bring him food and take care of him and things like that. We thank a lot for everyone that helped to uh, take care of the rock, uh, of the rock man. Excuse me. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. And may Allah uh, be pleased with them. My next question for you, sir, is uh, what do you do for fun, Brick? Well, I hear you ask other people that too. <laughs> I don't know what I tell them too. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you know, I like comedy, man. So sometimes, you know, I like to listen to or watch comedy. And um, where well, I grew up in Brooklyn, man, we oh, we were brutal. With the, with the comedy, you call it, you know, ranking or playing the dozens and stuff like that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But, uh, I, I, but I, tell, I don't like vulgar and vulgar comedy, you know, they talking about sex and all that other stuff. But I like um, uh, uh, intelligent, I'll say it like that, comedy, clean comedy. I mean, you got Dave Chappelle. Uh, I've seen some Christian comedies uh, uh, and, and things like that. So that's just one thing. I can't say that's what I, you know, do. Uh, uh, you know, just to have fun per se, but that's what, that's what I could think of right now. Yes, sir. And might I recommend uh, Sinbad? I think uh, me and my sister are the only people we know who are Sinbad fans like in the world, but <laughs> Sinbad can make you laugh, and he, I never paid attention to the fact that he doesn't cuss, but all his stuff is right, like, right. and he's now very I watched, funny. I watch the ones that cuss too, but you know, that was yeah. one of my worst habits, cursing or whatnot. Like, yes, sir. Never... Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, my next question is, because you have daughters and you, they're on your Facebook and uh, you've been seen with them, um, when Kobe Bryant passed away, they had a term called girl dad. It was like all the fathers Ooh. should take care of their daughters and in their daughter's life. Um, what advice would you give to future fathers? Wow. And you just, well, you sometimes you, you it's, it's not a thing where it, I can't say you, you're prepared for it, but innately, most of us are prepared for it. You know, men, fathers that shirk their duty, you know, I, I, you know, I can't understand that, you know. Uh, um, I, if you can, you know, one, if you can't take care of yourself, I don't know how you're gonna take care of, uh, of someone else. But once you become a father, it changes everything, man. You can't do things the way you know, you're used to. Now you have uh, a responsibility. I, I told people, I said, I will collect cans off the street to take care of my family. You know, I'll go work here or there to take care of my family. So by the grace of Allah, I, I don't think my family could say they ever had their lights turned off or, um, uh, uh, um, I mean, I've been late here and there, but, you know, or, 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 you know, having, you know, the essentials of life. You know, we didn't have the Jordans or the Gucci's and all those other things, but um, they had enough. And by the grace of Allah, with myself and their mom, Sister Loretta, you know, we took care of make sure 
you know, again, you need the mother, the wife or whatever. You got to work in, in a, a, a harmony with that. So you take care. But I've worked two jobs, you know, two, a messenger job, as we used to call it, and a security guard job. I've worked sick. So I don't want to hear no man tell me he can't get one job. Uh, I don't want to work for the devil. And, and while I'm doing that, I'm still making bow ties. I'm still making uh, uh, clothes and other things to uh, to take care to take care of the family. Uh, praise be to Allah. So, I mean, that, that's just one aspect of it, you know, because, you know, I, I might fall short here or there. Again, we need to get that training. Uh, uh, um, FOI to give you that training. And just even outside things that teach us how to raise, you know, our children. You look at your father, your grandfather, your aunt, your uncles, as far as you know, as far as us as men. Yes, sir. Your friends to 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 uh to learn that. I don't have any boys, but I wish I had boys so I could punch them in the chest and the stomach and stuff like that. <laughs> and do that to girls when they get an attitude. And, yes, <laughs> and I'm soft on the girls because you know they could come back here, stay here anytime. But boys, I'd be like, man, you got to get up out of here, man. Yes, sir, you can't yes, stay sir. here. You know, got to. <laughs> but the girls, I'm like, nah, you ain't got to pay rent. Nah, you ain't got to do this. Yeah, I mean, they they they've been helping me out. You know, I got to give it to them. You know, I'm like, ah, but uh, you know, I never really uh, demanded it. But um, people say, oh, you spoiling them. You doing this? You, well, I'm a, I'm a dad. You know, and like you said, what do you call it with, with Kobe? Girl dad. <laughs> yeah, girl dad. Yeah, I mean, I know I've missed some of their practices and things like that, but as many I, you know, took them to when they had to go to their games and things like that. But, uh, you know, some of the time might have been working or sometimes this might have been lazy dad laying on the couch and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Um, Brother Razak says, that's like from Lake Slam, Brother uh, Razak. I'm going to butcher your name. Razak. Lake Slam. Uh, Brother Salim says um, they had uptowns and ups though, and your daughter Kaneta says teach daddy talk about duty, and who said that they were spoiled? She needs names. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my my next question uh, for you, Brother Kenneth, is um, I just I see you work. I see you uh, so serious. I see you always on your on your uh, on your duty. I'm like just always at the mind. I've always seen you in that light. What do you want your legacy to be, Brother Wow. Yeah, that's one of the questions you asked. Man, I just say I was a good brother. You know, that I helped try to help, uh, well, I helped the nation, help Minister Farrakhan, Honorable Minister Farrakhan, Honorable Elijah, Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in this work, you know, but this is my life. I've been in the nation longer, you know, than I say I've been, you know, not in the nation. Four yes, years sir, with the yes, minister, sir. seven years as, you know, just like I say, being a street follower. And um, I mean, wow, I, 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 I thought of that, but I, I thought I had an answer for that. <laughs> 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 what I, but your legacy, man, you know, you, they say your reputation precedes you. That's part of it. You got some, you know, you got a good legacy and a bad legacy, you know, people especially when they're gone, you don't want to speak about any of their, you know, the bad, the bad, you know, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent, you know, but um, most people, I think you say, yeah, brother Kenneth, he was a good brother. He was a brother. Uh, um, again, one of the best bow tie makers there is brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. They call me bow tie Kenneth, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. Um, Brother Salim said, indeed, a good brother and truth teller. And Brother Herb says, um, and sends you greetings as well. Um, that's Brother Salim. That's Brother uh, in, in, New, in, in New York, formerly Brother Sherwood. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise be to Allah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I stayed at his house when I was up there in Brooklyn. I prayed Allah I didn't contaminate his business. <laughs> <laughs> I called brother. I said, brother, I'm sorry, man, but uh, I'm COVID positive, man. But uh, we, we we stayed, you know, stayed away from each other. But uh, yes, sir. Praise be to Allah. My my uh, my last question for Brother Kenneth is, for you, like you saying, 1980, uh, that's before many of us were born, and uh, wow. you you been you've been in it. What advice would you give to future generations in order to keep, you know, our faith and stay ten toes down, 
mm. in the in the belief in the true and living, uh, what advice would you give us? Wow. You know, it's, it's different things for different people. You know, you don't want to be, as brothers say, we say, brother, a 90 day wonder. You know, you got to pace yourself. Uh, um, this is a, a, like I say, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yes, sir. And, you know, to thy own self, you know, be true. Uh, as, as youth, and I, I, I was, uh, I was going to say this to you before, the youth in the nation of Islam, they grow up in the nation, restrictive laws and everything. And by the time they get of age, they go into the, to the world. I'll put it like that. Right. Yes, sir. I was in the world and by the, I've been in there, you know, we had our snout all in there. I'm tired of the world. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to come <laughs> into the nation. So yes, it's this dynamic where, you know, the, the, the youngins that were in the nation, they want to get, it's, it's that pull that, you know, pulling them uh, to the world. And the main vices, you know, is going to be the sex, the drugs, the uh, uh, sometimes the money and stuff like that. So that was a dynamic that I, I was looking at. I was like, okay, how can we, you know, reverse that we'll make it where once the young Muslims come of age, we have something for them, you know, to keep them in the mosque. Yes, and sir. that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a longer subject, but um, pace yourself and, you know, put your hands to the wheel, man. Go out there and, and again, sometimes you know, the young, young brothers that are out like brother aside, he wasn't that active, but he had a lot of influence out there. Yes, sir. And a lot of times I can't get to brothers like the brothers do, you know, in the world. Once they see me come, oh, here we go. <laughs> but, you know, the other brothers could come up around them, but you just don't want to fall victim to the world. You want to come, come to the Mars, man, you know, and, and help out whichever way you can. Because that's what I did as 20 year old. We came there. We were the ones holding posts. We were the ones dumping the garbage. We were the ones locking down the Mars, you know, afterwards. Yeah, you're going to go through uh, certain little other things here and there, but um, try to let that be like a, it's hard to be water off the duck, off the duck back, man. But um, come to your, uh, uh, fight for your nation, man. Praise be to all. Fight for your nation. Yes, sir. And thank you very much, Brother Kenneth, for your sacrifice. Yeah. And thank you for the sacrifice of your family. Um, you. My my family loves you and your family, and we just we oh, uh, yes, pray that you uh, keep doing the good work and hold it down yes, for Atlanta. Sir. I'm sorry, but Salim, he doesn't count as Brooklyn as much as you think he does. He's from Atlanta, he be down here as much as I've been. He's, he's just Atlanta as I am. We be down here as long as I am. So we, he's Atlanta, brother Salim. <laughs> uh, but may Allah bless you, Brett Kenneth, to continue to fight and be a good brother, Brett Kenneth. Always be kind. Well, a before brother. I go out, I gotta tell you, man. I wish you would. I wish you had the opportunity to drill me because I was one of the top drillers, brother. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yes, sir. I didn't know that. And that was another story. I know we're going to close out. It's been an hour. But uh, people will tell you about the debates I have in drilling. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. Yeah, I, I love the way the brothers do the drill. I mean, especially L.A., when they come out, they just blow us all away, man. Even back yes, then in the, LA, in, in the 80s when L.A. would come out. But we got champions. We got you. How many times champion? Three-time champ? Two-time, two two-time. Two two-time champ. You know, and uh, again, my brother Eric. I thank a lot of my brother, Eric, who's a, a lieutenant up there in New York, and my brother, Steven, who's not active, but we were the three brothers, had three of us mm. in the mosque. Myself, the oldest, but my brother, Eric, and my brother, Steven. So I thank you, brothers, an honor and a privilege to be on this show. Praise be to Allah. Uh, uh, coming in person, of Master Farad Muhammad. Thank him for raising the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank Allah, you know, for him and his family, bro. Praise be to Allah. All right. Thank you all for watching People's Podcast. Stay tuned. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam.